Okay, so we're going to get started. So welcome everyone to the Low Art Museum's talk, William Wegman and the Polaroid 20 by 24 camera on location in Miami. I'm Jody Seifer. I'm the Curator of Education at the Low Art Museum, and I'm honored to officially welcome everyone to this virtual talk, which features William Wegman and John Reuter. Uh, we really want to thank our sponsors for this event tonight. The Arnold and Augusta Newman Foundation has been our great supporter of our lecture series in photography, whom without we could not have all these wonderful talks um, in person and virtually. So we are very grateful to the foundation. Um, also, we are grateful to for the support of the Miami-Dade County Department of Cultural Affairs and the Cultural Affairs Council, the Miami-Dade Mayor and the Board of Commissioner and the State of Florida, Department of State, the Division of Cultural Affairs and the Florida Council on Arts and Culture and the City of Coral Gables. Um, tonight's talk is available with closed captions. So if you would like to utilize that feature, you can click on your Zoom menu and look for the little live transcript or the box with the CC in it. Also throughout the program, we invite you to type in your questions in the Q&A feature. Uh, we will get to the questions at the end if they are not already answered in the talk. We hope to get to as many as possible, so keep them coming. And please also look out for a survey when you sign off tonight when you close the webinar, a survey will pop up and we really appreciate you taking a few moments to fill it out. It really helps us for our grant reports and also um, we do read them. <laughs> so thank you for that. I also wanna let you know about our next virtual talk, which will be on Thursday, July 22nd at 5.30 PM. You wanna hear a sort of spicy and interesting story. It's artistic ideals and ideas go to court, Whistler v. Ruskin presented by Amanda Zender. She's the Chief Curator for Special Collections and Museums at the University of Delaware Library. This will be a talk about one of the uh, most famous conflicts in art history. James Abbott McNeil Whistler um, sued John Ruskin for libel um, over this image that you see here on the screen, his painting of Nocturne in Black and Gold, The Falling Rocket from 1875. So the presentation will not only talk about the history of Whistler v. Ruskin trial, but the art and the writing of these major art world figures. So you can register for that now on the website low.miami.edu. Um, if you just click on the calendar and July and you can click register. So we hope you'll join us for that. And now I also want to get to tonight's program. So I really would like to thank William Wegman, John Reuter and Christine Virgin for all of their gener generosity in being here tonight and all the work you put into this presentation. And also my colleagues at the Low, everyone has had their hand involved in not only this talk and program, but the exhibition, which is will be on view when we open the Low Art Museum in person in August. And there will be a digital preview on our website um, very soon, likely tomorrow or early next week. And we hope that you can come visit us if you're in the area in August when we open and see the show in person. And there's a beautiful catalog as well. Um, this exhibition called Instant Miami will be on view through September 16th. And it was it's co-curated by Michoko Okaya, director of Lafayette Art Galleries and Nestor Armando Gill, assistant professor of art at Lafayette College in Easton, Pennsylvania, whom we would also like to thank for their help with this amazing exhibition. So without further ado, I would like to introduce our two speakers tonight. They have very extensive resumes, so please visit their websites for more information, but I am gonna read an abbreviated intro. So William Wegman's paintings, drawings, videos, photographs have been exhibited in museums and galleries internationally. He received his BFA in painting from the Massachusetts College of Art and his MFA in painting from the University of, University of Illinois Champaign-Urbana. 
He's of course best known for his work featuring his Wamaraners, a collaboration which began in the 70s with his dogman Ray and which continue today with Flo and Topper, who you can see behind him soon. Wegman and his dogs have appeared on David Letterman, Saturday Night Live, Sesame Street, the cover of The New Yorker, and French Vogue. He's created many children's books and videos inspired by the dog's various acting abilities, including Cinderella, Mother Goose, Farm Days, and many more. Wegman's numerous books for adults include Man's Best Friend, Fashion Photographs, William Wegman 2024, the New York Times bestseller Puppies, Bay, William Wegman, Paintings, and Being Human. He's had numerous retrospectives that have toured Europe, Asia, and the US, including Wegman's World, Wegman, William Wegman, Paintings, Drawings, Photography, and Videotapes, Funny Strange, Hello Nature, just to name a few. His recent exhibitions include Before, On, After, William Wegman, and California Conceptualism, and at the Metropolitan Museum of Art and William Wegman being human and of course in St. Miami. John Reuter was born in Chicago, raised in California, moved to New York for college at SUNY Geneseo and then on to graduate school at the University of Iowa. Following graduate school, Reuter began working for Polaroid Corporation first as a researcher, re sorry, as a research photographer and later as main photographer and director in the 20 by 24 studio. Throughout the 30 years of working with other artists, Reuter has always pursued a very experimental direction with Polaroid materials quite different from his studio clients. In 2009, he started a new company with partners to continue to offer the 20 by 24 camera and film technology to artists and photographers. John is a part-time professor at the University of Hartford in cinema studies and photography, and his work has been published in View Camera, Popular Photography, Zoom, Aperture, Marie Claire, and Stern Magazine. He is working on a feature length documentary on the Polaroid 20 by 24 project titled Camera Ready. So without further ado, please give a virtual welcome to William Wegman and John Reuter. Unmute. Hi, everyone. Got to unmute too, Bill. Bill is muted. <laughs> Should never have muted him. There we go. Good. Oh, yep. Hello. The now we're ready. We're ready now. Oh good. <laughs> oh, hi John. Hi Bill. Okay. What can we talk about all that rehearsing, and and this is how we start. Yeah. So, uh, so wait, yeah, I guess we'll. Uh, do you want to go right into the slides, or do you want to have a little uh, intro of of your recollections of how this how this we'll started? Start with that slide of the. Um, camera being unloaded. Okay, so I'm going to share my screen. Just make sure this goes well here. Desktop to share and keynote. Okay, does everyone see that? The truck on screen now? I do. <laughs> okay, I guess if you do, everyone else does. So, so that was 1984. Right, we now know November-ish. We, we, we yes. found out yesterday. Uh, so uh, I guess it was organized by the museum to bring it down. They got a grant and everything. And uh, so uh, people, if people don't know, you and I have been working together since 1980 and uh, had done a number of shoots, uh, some on location in Maine, but mostly in the studio uh, up in Boston. We were still based in Boston at that time. And so uh, I traveled a lot with the camera in those days. I was thinking in 1984, I, I had been in Daytona Beach and in, in March and then in uh, uh, Birmingham, Alabama in July of that year. So uh, with this November shoot, that was my, my third major shoot uh, traveling the camera. So it's pretty pretty common for it to travel in those days. Uh, not so much now, but uh, here we are when we arrived and Bill is always the first to rush up and try to help get the camera yeah. off the truck, right? <laughs> so, uh, yeah. exactly. So, uh, okay, we're gonna, as we move forward, it's just gonna be uh, several, several times and several venues so you know all in miami and then later in maine but uh we're so we're going to jump from the, to the regular miami proper to miami beach here and uh setting up with the camera so this is the camera under this tremendous dark cloth it's a it's a 240 pound camera on wheels 
as you can see. And uh, what makes it really special besides its large scale is the fact that the processing components are, are all inside that box that you see under the black cloth. And uh, one of the reasons we cover it is not only is it useful for, for Bill to see through the back, but uh, you really need to protect the processing part from the sun because it, the rollers open and so it's, it's, uh, it's sensitive to, to light like that. And I'll let Bill take over from here uh, for a bit. Uh, this is, you know, after we are in the club. Uh, so I'll let Bill describe what that was and why we have these people on the beach. Well, we went to a Cuban nightclub called Le Violin and met the actors and actresses that performed regularly there. And they were very excited about <clears throat> us borrowing them and uh, photographing them, both in the club, which you'll see later, and here at the beach. And what's really fun with this camera is it, you know, it is a kind of a crazy big camera. Barbara Bush told me it looked like the camera that a clown would use. And so it, it attracts a crowd. And so this fellow uh, sitting with his fan just showed up. So we placed him there. The two performers you see standing on this wall were, were uh, from the club and they were very happy to, to have something important to do, they thought. And they fortunately were all wearing red. I didn't realize that this would work out so well. But uh, uh, so there I am, I'm uh, posing them. And I guess later we'll see the actual picture. Yeah. And so this is that same truck that you saw us unloading. And, and often on location, we'll make it sort of a mobile studio. So these are, as the prints are coming out, they're, they're still somewhat tacky and wet. So they have to be hung up to dry. And also, it's always good to view them and everything. And so I think at this point, we're still at uh, at the Grove Isle Club, which is uh, outside of Miami, where it's part of is Coconut Grove. Is it part in Coconut Grove? Does anybody on staff know exactly where that is? But so these are the grounds, right, Bill? And, and uh, as you recall, these were just passersby walking, walking by who also, again, were attracted to the camera. But Marty Margulies, who, who um invited us to Grove Isle and housed me. Uh, <laughs> uh, we thought that would be a safe place to start. And uh, and these people just came along. And so you'll see some other pictures with, uh, there, there I'm setting up another shot and they're watching me do this. And John took this snapshot. There's the big camera and the ocean and I look quite happy. <laughs> I'm not sure why, but how could you not be happy with a big camera like this and these charming children performing for you? Um, Looking back, we're kind of lucky nobody fell off that edge there. Right? Yes. <laughs> you didn't think about it back then, but now you certainly do. Well, the reason I like this camera in the first place is, you know, not by today's standards with digital, but it's instant. So in 90 seconds, you get to see what you did and you get to uh, adjust your uh, game plan. If it's in the studio, I would change maybe backdrop colors or or move the dog this way or that way or, or whatever. But, but out in, in nature here, you just go into the truck and see what you've got and, and, uh, and work it out. Yeah, it's, it's definitely not a camera that was designed to be to be used outside. Uh, obviously, we, we've done it a number of times. And, and after this, we went on to do a whole number of location shoots up in, in Maine, where Bill has a, has a home and, and a, a lodge up there. So uh, we learned as we went, because there was no track record of uh, how to shoot location outdoor photography with the 20 by 24. They just nobody had done it. And so uh, we learned every year as we went. And so in 1984, we're a little we kind of know a few things, but not everything. And I, I guess we we're just lucky we didn't get lots of light leaks and other issues. I don't really recall many, but. What I really liked is when you guys were fussing with a camera, getting it balanced and making meter readings and making it so it wouldn't tip over, I would think up of what I was gonna do because I never thought beforehand, uh, maybe, maybe I did, but it never worked out well. So I would always just think on the spot and it was almost like a performance that this thing instigated, right, John? Yeah, yeah. Particularly when lots of other people are, are uh, 
something like this, people, it, it is a performance because people are watching and everything. And even in probably in the nightclub, it was that way. And certainly on Miami Beach, it was. Uh, in the studio in New York, of course, it was just the, the crew and, and you, you, you and the dogs and, and whoever your assistants are. But uh, very different when you're outside there. So very the, interesting to stare at a subject and uh, then get to see it almost that size flattened out, you know, as, as like a map and you learn a lot about the space that way. Yeah. So here's Bell looking through the back. Uh, it does have kind of a ground glass sort of scenario. It's not glass because it's so large. Uh, and it has this sort of Fresnel screen that sort of captures the light and moves it. But it's still, even with a dark cloth outside, it was really hard to see, right, Bill? I mean, a lot of times we would just yeah, look at the down. first print and then know what the, what the frame was and then kind of go from there. That's pretty much it. You just sort of zero in. And after a while, John, you really got to predict exactly what I should be doing before, you know, even though I didn't know what I should be doing. <laughs> so you, you really co-authored um, a lot of these, most of these. Yeah, well, I, I knew where you wanted the dogs usually, and I think that's key. These characters are <laughs> like different. where on what side of the frame and, and everything. I remember sometimes with, with Tracy, we were saying, why are you putting the dog over there? <laughs> it's like now, We're talking about dogs, but there's no dogs in these pictures because I was between dogs. Between dogs. We'll get the dogs I later. I wasn't right? even sure that I was going to get another dog after Man Ray died in 1981. We had the camera in Maine, and we took some pictures um, towards the end there with him. But after, it wasn't until 86 that I got another dog and 87 when I started to photograph her. But here, here we're setting up some sort of uh, preposterous situations <laughs> in front of the uh, Cavalier Hotel. And yeah, it's some, an updated picture of that hotel. Yeah, right here. This is kind of cool. This is, yeah, this from, is uh, the museum staff like pulled this up for us yesterday. Yeah. So look at all that stuff they added and the color and that yellow building isn't even there at all. That the, yeah, so very uh, different. Or do you think it's the one on the right? It's just just no. It's it's flush up against it. Yeah. So uh, that's that's pretty cool. But uh, I love this picture. It's particularly the little the lady sitting there with the in the chair and, uh, and the jogger running. Yeah, around. I don't know if the jogger was in the Polaroid or not, but. Uh, yeah, and I love the cars in this one too. It, looked, it certainly looked like Miami Vice era, you know, like '84 so everything. So, uh, so yeah, it looks like a very pleasant place to stay now. That's for sure. And so, as I recall, you were you were orchestrating people way off in the distance uh, as well. And I don't know how well they showed up in the Polaroid, but uh, uh, I guess that's what you're looking at there, trying to trying to organize them. You think this guy would be smiling more, you know, with uh, with what's going on there? But uh, I, I mean, he's yeah. just focusing really hard on holding her up. That could be it too. And there's the smoking director there. That's yeah. in, in those days, still smoking back in those days. The performers were so happy, weren't they, John? I remember. Yeah, they were so great to work with and pleasant. And uh, I, I, I imagine his red spandex outside in the sun must have been pretty uncomfortable, but he never let on. Yeah. Really good weather for this, didn't we? Look at those. Yeah, guys. beautiful. I guess yeah, November. So it certainly would. A lot of times, in, you know, in Miami, I've, I've shot many times in Miami in the in the heat when it's in the 80s and high humidity, just like it would be up in Maine. That that's one of the most difficult times to shoot with a camera, just because the film is very noodly. It takes a long time for the prints to dry, and uh, uh, and sometimes it just runs through the camera in an odd way. So. Uh, you know, up in Maine, for instance, just because it did get so humid. Do you remember, Bill, you built a room with a dehumidifier in it just to store right, the air dryer. Because right. yeah. they just never dried in the humidity. It's very, very interesting. Well, here's one of the near far things I think you were organizing before uh, people further off in the sand. And uh, I don't I don't think you organized the truck back there, but uh, <laughs> or the maybe, lifeguards and things. Maybe the actual picture will show up further in the talk. We'll see. Yeah, I don't know if, if one of the Polaroids of that shot, we'll, we'll see. I forget which Polaroids are, are in here. But uh, uh, so now speaking of Polaroid, we, we yeah. move to that. And I'll let Bill describe the scene. It's, it's in the nightclub. Yeah, this is in the nightclub. It's three of the performers and the uh, curtains coming down. And I think a famous author used this as a cover of his book, Paget Powell, I believe. I can't remember oh. the name of the book, but for uh, a writer. Yeah. And then prior to going in there, we're, we're still outside. This is right. I think it's the building where we unloaded the 
camera right there, way back in the in the early That's part. That's a different there. fellow, though, isn't it? Holding that. Yeah, it's not the guy who has the uh, who's working with the, the woman in red. It's a different guy. Yeah, and then that very important shade or you, or you found there in the thrift store. Wonderful textures in their skin that reflect the surroundings, and it's all kind of about to be plugged in, as you can see in the lower left there. Yeah. An electric curtain. <laughs> it is pretty amazing how the shade and the and the stone and the sidewalk all match. I mean, maybe it's the Polaroid reducing the color to a smaller palette, but uh, it's it's uh, kind of cool that I way. I still love the Polaroid marks that you get from the processing, the uh, things along the side and that uneven band at the bottom. Yeah, and, and every camera, you know, there were five cameras and we probably worked with certainly two and possibly three over the years. Uh, each has their own kind of signature and, and that that's that yellow off and on stripe is is uh, created by these rubber tires around the rollers that are designed to keep the reagent from squeezing out the sides because it's just nowhere to stop it. Uh, and this uh, these got flattened. Someone left the rollers closed and they were just slightly flattened. So it gave that undulating mark as time went on. So you can always tell that's a very distinct signature with this camera. And you can see that it was used, obviously, for this whole shoot. But uh, sometimes you won't see those marks on Bill's work. You'll see white down there instead. OK, you, back in the no, nightclub. Man. I think one we're there thing for you never shot. wanted to hear to get back to the processing was cocked pod. Remember that became part of our vocabulary. Cocked yeah. pod, Bill. Yeah, and you weren't a fan of them. I, I, it's like someone like Julian Schnabel can't wait to have a cock pod, but uh, and I've never been a fan. But what that means is it falls crooked. You know, it's a gravity feed system, and it's this tray. And so, like when you roll the camera around or certainly move it on the truck, you can't even have them in there in the in the truck. Uh, back in the day, we used to have like 15 of the pods on a tray so we could shoot quickly. Although we never did. Um, and sometimes if because it, it was a chain driven system that would just throw the pot off the end and you know, as you can imagine any number of things could happen to make it fall crooked and if it falls crooked the picture you know has a diagonal part missing because it the pod didn't process there so but uh, don't see don't see many curtain. here this curtain looks kind of like a cocked pod doesn't it look like a polaroid in a way <laughs> That's what I was thinking when I got so attracted to this. But the real fun with this picture is, besides the performers who you've met in some of the other pictures, was the sets that uh, were available to us in this club. And uh, it's very, very, uh, call it Baroque. No, you wouldn't, but let's see some more pictures. Yeah, so it was it. Uh... Did we shoot in the round, or was it like one one stage in the front? I, I don't actually recall that part of it. I think it was just remember? one stage, and we could stage. just move the sets in and out, lower oh, okay. some, drag some in, and uh, that we did. And here they're working with some uh, Polaroid material, actually. Yes, uh, right. Three of them have foam rollers. They're, they're foam cushions for when the cases of film are shipped. The film is on a big roll that's 22 inches. And so those foam donuts protect it from being squished up and down. And so uh, these these women are, seem to particularly attracted to them. I'm yeah. not sure. I never really had to direct them. They just did whatever they wanted to do. Yeah. And uh, and, I, and here you go. It's a fueled by uh, Cuban coffee, though, too, right? That's right. I'm addicted to that. Now, we found out that the little boy is the son of the owner uh, in this swimming pool on this set, in this happy uh, odyssey. And then the guy on the, on the right-hand panel, the guy in the center is, is one of the, the people from the low at the time who was helping us on the shoot, as I recall. So he's, he kind of pops in and out of a number of pictures. I think I was really interested in how the space could get broken up by these panels, you know, where it would look like uh, art even though, you know, just imagine if I had to use set paper and do my own things, it would be about something else. So yeah. I can kind of create some sort of a post pop art painting style here. Yeah, there, there was a time though, I think, you know, before, yeah, I think before the shoot, you would come into work even, even after Man Ray passed away with, 
with friends and, and some of your friends had dogs and we went to the museum school quite a bit and, and you worked a lot with fabric then as I recall you know like pretty elaborately you had all kinds of sweeps and you're not unlike that red velvet can uh, curtain that was falling in the, be the beginning uh, so you're kind of into that already prior to the shoes I remember that's right I forgot yeah you're also into your belly button which looks great in this okay. photo <laughs> That is so silly. Why did we allow this photograph to be filmed? <laughs> uh, well, if you've got it, do it, right? You've flopped it there, so. She seems, you know, interested in it, though. She's pretending. Yeah. <laughs> so th didn't we identify this baby also? It's also... Uh, I can't remember. The owner? Was it the owner there? But there's something really evil about smoking around a baby, isn't there? <laughs> Well, not in the 80s, though. Uh, I don't think it was quite, uh, hadn't caught on quite as much as, as it did in later decades. But uh, uh, yeah, I, don't think, I don't think pregnant women were smoking then, but I don't think people realized just, you know, secondhand smoke. I don't think it was as big a deal uh, than it, as it is, obviously, now. She was a great performer. I really loved working with her. In this picture, I really like seeing again. Yeah, so it's, I guess that's the baby's baby carriage. But uh, and uh, anytime we got a smoke machine, we were pretty happy too. So that was it's great. Been like a, a sacrifice or something. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, yeah. And we're trying to decide. She looks like she's out of a Gustave Moreau watercolor yeah. or something. You know, that very symbolist sort of posing and everything. I think that's you know, pretty. The style of acting that uh, Del Sartre talked about, writing about um, Sarah Bernhardt. Yeah, that's, that's a good. Yeah. But uh, yeah, so the volcano and I guess the babies, that's where the baby went. But she goes up in smoke. <laughs> right. And then re-emerging as a grown child uh, several, several pictures later. As I recall, the, the club wasn't that big either, right? I mean, it, it was kind of a tight space that we were yeah, it was, so working in. Was, love that curtain. Yeah. And of course, we would bring all our own lights and everything. So, uh, you know, the, the Polaroid, the big Polaroid requires a lot of light. And uh, we had these the brand at that time was Balcar. And uh, but we would have close to, I don't know, 15, 16,000 watt seconds of light, which is a tremendous amount of flash light, not not so much continuous light, but flash light. So lots of different packs, soft boxes and things like that. So we would, you know, that would be on the truck and we would set all that up. Uh, outdoors, which you'll see soon, we, we would sometimes have one flash uh, just to fill in because the film is pretty contrasty. And so with, with the bright sun, which is great, Miami sun is the perfect sun to shoot in. But uh, so we, we might have a flash to go with that too. And it's hard to say, you can't tell. For these long shots, it, maybe not. Maybe that's just all uh, natural light could be. I study painting, so I don't know anything about what you're talking about. <laughs> right. So. But here's that gentleman again. He was in quite a few pictures there. So uh, I love I loved the way his pants fall and everything. And then <laughs> and then just the awkwardness of the woman in the right is kind of uh, hilarious. There. Game, though, isn't she? Yeah, not not very elegant <laughs> at all. You could have probably should have turned her. But uh, Maybe he, maybe the the guy knew that was his best angle, so he just turned her whatever way was was going to work for him, <laughs> so he could uh, he could see there. And this is quite elegant, I think, and lyrical. You know, I think that's one of my favorite ones that we took on the beach. Yeah, and then this the passed out guy. The passed out guy is great. Yeah, it's just uh, not it was there when we came and there when we left. I guess right. It's a really weird counterpoint. This picture. Yeah. And look how his fingers are perfect on the horizon there. That's, that's uh, completely I think, violent. I think that's what I would, must have been thinking about when I started to pose them is this counterpoint of what's there and what shouldn't be there, but what is there. Yeah. Be some kind of a clash. And that hut looks very much like a prop you would use in yeah. <laughs> or have in your own studio there. Okay, so now we're jumping back to Grove Isle uh, with the young children. And uh, let's see, a welcome club shakes and club sandwich. Shakes and sandwich. Yes. 
So you put that on there, right? Or was that something already on there? Was that the first one on there that you then took off? I think you saw me doing that. So yeah. In one of the, the shots. Yeah, they did have good club sandwiches, though. Yeah. And this one says dual function. And so it's the same girl and same little handbag there. She's becomes a pillow. <laughs> So here definitely we have a flash uh, going almost as, so generally would kind of it's called dragging the shutter you might put it at a quarter second or something like that uh, once the two because uh, you know whatever that you have to work off whatever the daylight was and then try to make the flash uh, you know feel like we probably have to flash a little strong here but it's a done deal when now looking at the grass i remember the first encounter with polaroid color is that green was not a color that they cared about. They wanted red and uh, red and birthday party colors. Yeah, pretty much red. People I think. didn't take the camera outside. They don't take your SX-70 outside to take a picture of, you know, from your boat or whatever you take it, you know, of your girlfriend or, or you know, inside. So it wasn't, the color wasn't balanced, right, John? Yeah. Or, uh, well, that just the way the dyes mix together on an instant film. They just can't do certain colors well. Uh, I like my story better about. <laughs> and the reason the grass is lit up now in the left-hand panel is I pointed the light down because she's down, yeah. and when she's up, I'm not pointing it there. So that's why the grass is light in one and dark in the other, pretty much there. Uh, and we only had one light. So had we had more lights, which you normally would in the studio, and 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 if it if we cared about it or if Bill cared about it, we would probably then uh, address the lighting there. But uh, uh, it's kind of hard when you're shooting outside, you get you get really distracted. It, it's it's very different than than being in the studio. There's well, just so much really going hard. on. You were you and Tracy and other helpers were working really, really hard moving the camera around. Yeah, it's it's, it's not it. easy. Yeah, uh, I was just fumbling around collecting people and props and doing things like this. <laughs> Uh, so we found out yesterday this was a reporter for yeah, the Herald? Yeah, covering the story, as it turns yeah. out, uh, for the Herald. Yeah, so... Uh, he really is a period piece guy, isn't he? He looks like he could be in uh, some sort of a TV series. He could have been in Miami Vice as uh, a reporter, a reporter in there. Okay, then we ventured out... Uh, which, yeah, like, like you and I had never done stuff like this. Uh, yeah. Never. I mean, I guess when with Man Ray outside, it was it's maybe yeah. you could actually say it's the same thing. But uh, to think about boats and there's your your fabric inclination showing up again there. Short lived period, but memorable. <laughs> and and the grass again is not being rendered well. So, so let's move on to another picture. It's, oh, there you go. There's a funny one coming up. This one's pretty funny, actually. I'm pretty proud of the, the dangling the cat over the yeah lady susan here <laughs> uh and some sort of fish in a net cat patiently uh, waiting for it there back to grove isle with marty margulies and company serving sandwiches uh, that's right <laughs> Now, did, did Marty eventually fund like a, a, a big art center in Miami? Did he get to have his own museum? In like the bakery building, I believe. Uh huh. Did that is that still existent or? Uh... We'll have to find out. Yeah. Okay. I guess the st anybody from Jody doesn't want to chime in, but that's okay. We can wait till later. Uh... They're not even watching. They went home. <laughs> <laughs> Probably, right. I'm yeah. happy to chime in. I didn't want to interrupt. <laughs> but yes, Margulies Warehouse is very popular and fabulous. Okay. Come visit. Yeah, it was. I guess at the time, we thought most of his art was in an apartment, right? Remember, he had a huge apartment in, in that complex, Bill, and he had like, you know, Jasper Johns and Rauschenbergs up there. And, and he drove uh, around in his beat up old Jeep so he wouldn't get, uh... <laughs> get mugged. Mugged, I guess. So this is this photograph. I can't believe I took it, but I did, and I'm really happy I did. But I, if someone else wants to claim it, they can, uh, <laughs> because it really is not like something I would ever do. But that's what the Polaroid thing is is all about. It made me, you know, change my manifesto. It made me think about color, size. Uh, you know, it just led me astray happily. 
uh, save me from myself in a way. Uh huh. There he is again, another guy. Our bag man there. A younger, a younger version of him. <laughs> that wall, you know, with a plug. I guess that once you're set up, yeah, right. <laughs> and happy with it, then you, you just get everyone moving, moving through uh, like a conveyor. Isn't it interesting this picture where the white of the sidewalk looks like it's the pod in a way. Yeah, or I was thinking like a torn, like the end of a canvas, you know, like yeah. a, like people who paint to the edge and then you would stretch Very that. Literally. It looks like torn, torn canvas at the bottom a little bit. Okay, now we're going to jump to Maine. Uh, I'll let Bill describe where this exactly this is. I don't remember. It's on the lake where I spend summers and also part of the winter or almost like half the year in Rangeley. And it's a, a deep, cold lake. Uh, trout and salmon. I first went up to Maine because I like fishing. Now I don't care about it, but uh, <laughs> there it is waiting for me. And those are floating docks, right? Or, or, or are they? No, those are rocks. This is the shallow end right here. Uh -huh. this, is a, this, is a, this is a dock that um, I don't know how we arranged for this, but. Uh, this this has to be Tracy's camera. I probably wouldn't have taken because we had two cameras we used, one from Boston, one from New York at later dates. And uh, I would always put Tracy's in the most difficult positions of just in case something happened. It was always weird to co connect strobe lights really close to the water there. We did it so much. It was it was pretty crazy. Yeah. Uh, so here's here's a, one of our main crews here. Uh, I'm the shirtless one. And then uh, that's Stacy Fisher, who was my assistant at the time. And then Tracy Storr, next to Bill's sister, Pam, uh, he ran the, the camera. Well, he was a student of mine. Uh, so, But eventually, when I moved to New York, he took over the Boston studio. And so we would sometimes, depending on schedules and things, take a camera from New York or take a camera from Boston. Uh, so. Boston was closer, so it was probably more or used used more often that way. But I'm not sure this is that same dock. Could be, but might not be. There were a number of the, these kind of docks out there, right? Yeah. There's two of the dogs are on the dock there. And this is a, at another lake, uh, Kinnebago Lake. And this is back in 70, 81, our the first year was it 81 john yeah it was it was 81 and uh it was september and i had never taken the camera outside I, i'd only been working on the project for about a year and uh you know the camera had been outside and, and uh but it's it's an open system you know there's a roller that opens and closes at the bottom so you have a, a box with sensitive film in it that it essentially has a hole in it at certain times and everything. And so you can see we have no dark cloth, no protection for the camera whatsoever. And uh, uh, we paid the price. We got pretty beat up on that. Plus uh, the wind came up shortly and it wasn't all that warm. Uh, so uh, we had no idea what we were doing. One of the images from there is coming up, although we're gonna jump to a little bit later time in the, in the next frame. The next to the camera is a Rangely boat, by the way. In the previous one? Yeah, the Rangely boat. Oh, on the ground there. It's called a Rangely boat, really. Wow. Okay. Very, uh, from the turn of the century, those boats. Interesting, huh? So this would have been a number of years later. Uh, There's another lake called Richardson Pond, and it's, it does have a shallow area, which we persuaded um, somebody to, to have you drive the camera out on so we could pose a dog. And, Oh, yeah, it, it w was a bit of an incline. It wasn't really a straight shot in. It was a little risky to, you know, the, it tilted quite a bit. Uh, and again, this would have been Tracy's camera that I would I would volunteer for, for these kind of assignments and everything. Uh, but we always had these spectacular days, right? You know, with the clouds and I mean, it rained a lot too, but uh, we were very blessed with that. And then we liked, <clears throat> liked getting into the lake so much that a few years later, we, we got a bigger truck. Uh, Dave, I guess, arranged those. Dave McMillan? Dave McMillan, yes. This says uh, Builder Supply. We must have borrowed it from Builder Supply. Yeah, out. see, by now we know that we should be covering the camera uh, from either rain or, or sun. Uh, you know, we, we have wanted to have, we have sandbags and everything. All that, on that first trip, we didn't do any of that kind of stuff. We just, just didn't know. So this is back to that first trip. So this is Stanley Rowan, who worked for me for a couple of years in the, in the very early years of the studio. Uh, he still lives in, he lives in Boston now, but uh, 
uh, he was the very first assistant I had. And that's that's Man Ray in the boat, right, Bill? That's right. And I'm near the boat, uh, about to position it so Stanley could take this picture. Yeah, I think it it would take you so long to get away from the boat and the water would get sort of messed up. So you actually backed him out a certain distance. And we were using, I believe, that rock in the distance is kind of a target to and then you would be out of frame and you would give the boat just the most gentle nudge possible and i actually think you did it from the other side the left side maybe you're retrieving it here um, and the boat would just be moving like you know one inch a second very slowly and when it got to the right spot uh, we would shoot it because i think what we were shooting like it was available light so the shutter was like at a 30 30th of a second uh, which is as, as fast as we could we could shoot the film wasn't very fast and uh, the lens that we had on here, I think is a 1200 millimeter and it's wide open aperture uh, was F24. So all we could do is stop down one stop at 32 to get a little bit of depth of field, but it was pretty far away. So, uh, so and this is one of the frames that, uh, and this is one of the problems we had with it, light leaks, that blue flash at the side there. I think there were one or two though that we got cleaned, didn't we, Bill? Uh, I think so, but this is the, the one that I liked the only one I liked. I like the way the headdress lights mm. up. I imagine this is as being a, a last picture of him where I would just let the canoe float around and I would drive back to New York. <laughs> and, uh, this was very near the end of his life. I was really thinking about sort of a way of capturing his his departure in a way. Mm. He was kind of game for anything, right? Yeah, he was as, as, as enthusiastic as Faye in the in the early years, but uh, he didn't have to try. He just was. Yeah, yeah. Well, this was there, very solid and super smart. Um, yeah. Okay, back to later in Maine. This is again the same the same Subaru. So this is about as deep as we got into the water. And I'd say we're maybe 20, 25 feet from the shoreline at this point, I think so, yeah. uh, which you kind of have to be because otherwise it looks like you're still shooting from the shore. Uh, and so it gave you a perspective. And I'm not, I don't even remember if we have any images from, from the lake. Well, most of the uh, pictures we took are of the dogs in the canoes. Uh, yeah, but, and then some though you had them on, on milk crates. So it looked like they were sitting right on the water. Oh, yeah. I always love those, those were great. Uh, and so obviously once the pictures were were done we i guess we would peel it on top of the car and then someone would ferry it back to the truck which was up up off the shore and uh, uh you know put tape them to the sides of the truck pretty similar to that shot that you guys saw from uh from miami <laughs> so was this for little red riding hood is or um, do you it could, it could be. Um, yeah. It probably was. I'm not sure what the shot ended up yeah. as that thing, but it's, it's uh, you know, Faye had eight puppies. Three of them became really important uh, performers along with Faye. And that's what led to all of these children's books. The first one being Little Red Riding Hood, the second one being Cinderella, and, and on and on. Yeah, and two, two of the dogs went to my assistants, right, <laughs> that you had. Yeah. So, and they just never really could work out as performers because they were often around. Uh, but they just, if they're not around the other dogs shooting, they don't. Yeah, they, the dogs teach yeah. each other, you know, if they're not doing it, then they won't. Uh, I got Faye rather old. She was almost a year when I started to work with her. And she somehow really wanted to work and was amazing right from the beginning, even though she wasn't trained as a puppy. All the others were just born into it, like acting troops. Yeah, so true. And so this little um, uh, cabin is, is called Sunset. And that was the original one that you had in 1981, the only one you had, right? Right. And then a number of years later, you acquired the lodge, which was across the street. Right. We'll see and a couple, of, a couple of other things here and there. So it's quite a compound now. It's really lovely to go right, up there. Yeah. 
Uh, so here, this is jumping back in time again, back to 1981, and this is inside that same cabin sunset. So, you know, you saw us so that first day on the lake. Uh, the second day, it rained, as it often would do, and all day. And uh, I loved it because that meant we are out inside where I was comfortable. We had our strobes and everything, and we take our time and all of that. So uh, we spent quite a long time on this particular shot, so I recall. So I call this Ray and Mrs. Lubner in bed watching TV. And that was my sister's dog, Leba was her name. And uh, I had a eight-year-old boy holding up that owl and then another person with a deer head. And uh, talk about the lighting a bit, John. What yeah, it was actually pretty complicated. You know, we, you have the flash to, to light the dogs in the bed and everything. Uh, but to get that lamp to render, we had to turn off the the strobe model lights so that they wouldn't render anymore. Do a four second burn for the lamp. And then I think the deer outside, it was so dark because it was raining. That was like another 30 seconds just to expose that. And you can see it move very blue, which is film reciprocity uh, to cause that to go blue. Uh, the TV in the foreground is actually a lighting case. And it's all wrong because the antenna is getting the blue light from the TV screen, but it's actually on top of the TV. But it kind of works, you know, so uh, we had a number of variants before that all came together. So I think this was the most complex you know, one. That we usually would take seven or eight shots and then one would be amazing and then we would stop once we got that amazing yeah. thing. And then we would just, or if it never, if it didn't happen by 10, we would just move on to something else, <laughs> right? right? Yes, yeah, nothing was more frustrating than like eight or nine of one that yeah, you knew was oh a Duke God. series. Once in a while, yeah. I would burrow on. I remember the first time I went to Polaroid, I took 40 pictures black on black because I didn't do color. And I got so depressed the next day that I brought in a little bottle of Revlon Red and painted Man Ray's toenail red. And that was my first color photograph. So it broke through. Yeah, that's a great one. There's a really, there's a really classic poster uh, of that. I actually found two copies of it recently, Bill. I was going through my 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 stuff, and so I have two, all rolled up for years. But the yeah. but the white's yellowed on it. Was a pretty it was a pretty white white that that photo was on, right? Do you remember? Yeah. yeah. Anyway, so I got two copies of that poster, which I should probably reframe one. Tell them. So here we are. We got a little sophisticated. We're actually leveling the camera with wood. <laughs> That was, that was around our accomplishments, our location accomplishments there. And that looks like Crookie out the window there. It is. You can tell by yeah. her ears. Patty had very different ears at Crookie. And uh, I'm wondering if this must be Little Red Riding Hood, but maybe not. I don't know. It's... It, it could be, but it could be a shot that I didn't use at the book. Yeah. It's yeah. Things that I wrote it later. I mean, that project was really because you, you had a film crew doing you as well right that dutch film crew during that shoot and oh, right yeah yeah so it was really really hectic i mean you really felt like you were performing and uh well, and we everything. used to work so hard now we don't <laughs> they were they were like they were like feature films to do them you know like we have you know when bill and i first went up there i think we had just one person no two people betsy was with us parts of the time and stanley uh but by this time i think we would sometimes have 10 or 12 people uh, working on them, you know, between my my stu uh, assistants and then I have studio interns. That, of course, everybody wanted to come up to Maine to do this, so uh, it was never hard to get people to want to help out on the shoots. But uh, but it got to be quite a quite a big crew at, uh, in those latter years. For sure. Oh, this is one of my favorite shots of Bill. The next, the second one coming up too is also one there. So we think that's. Chundo, right? The, the male of the of the four? I think it's actually Batty. Really? Batty? The face looks so big, huh? Could be. Yeah. No way to find out, but yeah, okay, so I guess if we could zoom in, maybe you could pick out some marks on them or something there. That's Man Ray. That's yeah. This I remember we picked you up, Stanley and I, in the truck. You were at some place I won't mention and uh so this was this is when you greeted Ray when you came out of the truck. He hadn't seen you in a, in a week or two, I guess. So. And that is Batty. Definitely Batty. Yeah, yeah. 
She loved to be near the camera for some reason. We, we used to always get worried because she liked to be at the back of it too. And, and the, she laid down on the on the, a blanket that has that acid in it. The developer was was alkaline, which is you know just as bad as an acid, but Very, it, uh, her, she got a couple little burns on her that uh, yeah. stuff will burn. It will definitely burn your skin. It's pH thirteen. This is one of my favorite location shots. We we, we totally look like a, a Hollywood film crew here, you know, with uh, the lights lights blazing and uh, I, I love the backlight uh, on uh, Batty there, just catching the way it's lighting her up. Very slender. Good one. Then I don't remember what the shot was that we took, but yeah, I don't I don't remember either. Uh, So this would be the front of the lodge, mm -hmm. a great shooting surface, just because uh, almost almost like a studio outdoors, practically, right? So yeah. And this Batty was uh, the expert balancer. We would always uh, have her balance on things. Faye could balance things on her nose, right, or on yeah. her head, and that Batty was just a great balancing. Period. Uh, the thing about Batty is she was foldable. She would drape over things. So, yeah, she was like a liquid dog. Yeah, could pour her onto the set. Right. When she was kind of narcoleptic, she would fall asleep. She would fall asleep on set. Yeah. That was so funny. So this turned into a really good shot, I think. That you'll see. Yeah. So let's, we'll look at the finished shot, and we'll go back to the to the behind the scenes, which is uh, is kind of cool. Theater seats that I got out of a, the Rangeley uh, movie theater that closed, and they doing it so they gave me the seats yep and that that's uh tracy stacy and andrea who worked with bill for a long time who's also a great artist and uh became a, like a professional belly dancer right bill or a performance artist so there's the batty fey crookie and chundo those are the four dogs that populated all my children's books yeah. uh, in the next 10 years or so. Uh, then Batty had puppies and, and I used one of hers a lot. So. so I don't know if there's any. I don't know if we have any of the, the uh, next generation. No. In this in this particular group. No. So this is back in Maine, you know, sometime again in the 90s. And uh, again, Batty good at balancing and Chundo struggling a bit, but I guess he got it in the end, right? Of course he did. It's really easy for a dog to do this, surprisingly, if they're not afraid. Problem with a the bike there. <laughs> yeah, right. looks like she's like doing like it's she's about really to crash. Dying. She's going to crash any minute. <laughs> there. I really yeah. work with, with the dogs by kind of touch rather than like um, Lassie was trained by words like Lassie, Haya, Pumba, Chow. And, but I, I would never say anything. I would just mold them onto, into position. I'd maybe say stay. Yeah. Well, you photograph Lassie, right? And, and then the trainer wouldn't let your dogs be in the space with them. And he said something like, get these dogs out of here. Well, yeah. He actually had the, the um, Lassie was never allowed to see another dog except one that they got for her, for him rather, because yeah. Lassie was a boy. Um, yeah. And we, we all felt the very- would kind of back him up like he was a truck. <laughs> yeah. his first day, hi ho, hi. Yeah, treated him like a horse almost. Yeah. And uh, he just seemed to have no personality. He just seemed like a sad dog. You know, we all kind of he was, he was very away cool. from that. Shoot, feeling yeah, beautiful dog though, yeah. So this is how we would would hey, uh, deal with the prince well outside. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, I'm just saying how rich Lassie was. Person. Oh, <laughs> yeah, right. So when we would peel the Polaroids, we needed to protect them from the wind, and so we developed this clamp system. And so the negative, this is the print, obviously, but pri while it's developing, the negative would be face down on it, and we would clamp that as well. And, and we learned the hard way that the wind would sometimes come by and just peel the print all by itself and, of course, ruin the exposure and everything. And then you kind of had to get it away from things. You know, dust could settle on it, so you had to ferry it away pretty quickly and get it into a protected environment 
which is you know usually the truck which is right there although sometimes if we are close to the house i guess we bring them inside the house and then this is our last photo um of the bike run there but not in the place that we had the setup shots but uh it's a, just a beautiful i love the backlight the shadow from uh baddies on the bike on the ground there it's just an amazing shot trick so that is the end of it there i guess i can stop sharing and uh do i have to do something uh let's see oh, you guys are good we stop sharing there we go so now we're just back on screen again there you have very lovely light on you there now bill can you oh, see <laughs> you got the sun in your yeah, eyes sounds blasting right in yeah Thank you guys so much. Yeah. That was really fascinating to listen to your Maybe I'll move back a bit. talk. There you go. That's that better. Yeah. yeah. Well, we don't hear you as well, but. Can that curtain get closed? We can practice at this hour. <laughs> right. That's right. We did. We, we rehearsed at 3.30. No, over there. That Just a little bit of that curtain. Well, we do have a couple of questions, if you don't mind me asking okay, them. Not at all. We're running out of time. I do want to point out um, that both um, Nestor Gill and Manuel are on, and they had um, some comments. Oh, good um, to hear. Nestor wanted to know if you could speak to the physical and social experience of moving, moving through Miami with the camera and engaging the with the curiosity of the onlookers. Go ahead. You know, it's so long ago, I do. <laughs> don't remember but well, obviously uh, that's how we attracted, really all, we attracted all those people wherever we were um the uh in the nightclub the people were the performers were really inspired because of the majesticness of the camera and it isn't like you, you have a nikon and you say can i take your picture buddy it really is a special occasion and i think that was that really brought brought performers out of the ones we found in the uh, on the beach and the ones at the nightclub it really really caused and the fact that they could see what was happening really uh created a lot a lot of uh buzz there yeah but, but generally the first reaction is people think you're making a film because they think it's a movie camera and with and they see the lights and a bunch of people and everything and and then you explain it's a Polaroid and they look at you completely quizzical. But once I see the print, you, you don't need to say anything else, right? Uh, yeah, I just remember everyone was super friendly wherever we went. Uh, no no big issues. <laughs> yeah, so you you only had a week, right? You were invited by the then director of the low, Ira Lick, to come down for a week and shoot. So you went to uh, Le Violin first, and then you went to the beach, and then you went to Grove Isle. You were going back. No, I think we started at Grove Isle. We probably we started walked. at Grove Isle because those yeah. were the first. This is easy to do, kind of safe. And uh, what did we do last? Maybe the harbor scenes. The Oops. maybe I, I honestly don't remember. Yeah. And you, you know, say? shortly after that, you know, Bill got a dog and we went into, we moved back in that direction. And so this work really kind of got forgotten a, a, a lot. And so our, I don't think our memories are as fresh because it wasn't shown and you weren't asked questions about it through the years. So, you know. It's, it just ended up in a box until uh, I was looking through all of the Polaroids a few years ago and Nestor happened to be uh, in my studio and he saw these and he got very excited. And that's really what led to the show at Lafayette and you know, back back where we are now. So thank you, Nestor. <laughs> yes, we're very grateful to have the opportunity to have the photos back at the low after all these years. Um, so on that note, um, somebody was asking also if the camera is possible to shoot in landscape format or only in portrait format. No, it's, it's portrait only just because the film is at the top and so you cannot you can't rotate that back we've but actually had do portable versions right? what's that bill you said do like mirrors to make it look sideways. in the studio you could shoot on the floor and so then you can orient it any way you want so you look into a mirror and you shoot straight down uh but we did have a portable camera later that could do horizontals not easily but the few horizontals that we did look so odd 
for the format that people didn't recognize was 20 by 24 is because they were going the wrong way. So uh, it was that was kind of a weird thing. But so no, it wasn't uh, designed to be uh, anything but a vertical camera. I know that I heard that Manuel has a question and I wanted to say that Manuel was was how we discovered the nightclub a violin. And he was the director of Holly Solomon Gallery where I was showing. And so he was a really our tour guide uh, to Cuban coffee and everything good in, in Miami. Yes, and he wanted to point out how instrumental the Miami Herald was to the project. And that's so I think that's why, I believe it was Fred Tasker who was in that um, shot, the scary mm -hmm. shot, yeah, um, who was the reporter. So there was a we there was a press release and they were covering it and um, there was a lot that went through bringing you all down but you there was obvious energy and connection and collaboration between you two over all the these years so it's really great to hear you talk to one another about them so I'm sort of wondering for both of you what you're working on now and Bill I know you said you would show us in your studio a little bit sure. Well, I have, I took some photographs last week, but for the past year and a half, I've been here upstate in my amazing studio, just painting. And all of the photographs I've taken and film and videos have been off my phone, which is kind of hard to take seriously. Some are quite charming and nice, but uh, it isn't like the old days where I had a Hasselblad and I would do those things. And then John would call me up and I would call him up and we would, drag out the Polaroid camera. So that was my work, that plus videos. But now I'm I'm just here painting and uh, working on my memoirs. <laughs> my, uh, yeah. Yes, conversations like this uh, prompt some memories there. Yeah. So it's good, it's good. Uh, well, I'm uh, still, believe it or not, that, that camera is alive and I still run a factory. Uh, I just was there today. Uh, it's been a huge struggle of COVID nearly killed us. It may still yet, but uh, we do have a future. I have some clients in China. I was actually in China right before COVID uh, working with some people to set up a studio there. And we would have done it that spring, you know, last summer uh, had COVID not happened. And so we're still kind of waiting. I might go later this year. I, I, I don't know. But uh, we also have been doing stuff with uh, uh, one instant in Vienna, which is doing like a pack film project, trying to bring, bring back pack film and, and peel apart film. So we're working on those those kind of areas. Uh, but for the last three years, I've been teaching at the University of Hartford, which I really love. Uh, it's very difficult to balance both of those things. They're, they're really, even though I'm a part-time teacher, I teach three classes. That's really full-time as far as I'm concerned. Uh, and uh, to, to weigh that with the studio, is, is, it's a bit of a challenge, but uh, I, I do love teaching and uh, uh, particularly cinema studies. I, I, I do uh, an intro to film class that I love doing. It's one of my favorite things uh, to do right now. And what about that documentary about the camera? Well, I am working on it. In fact, uh, <laughs> I, I uh, am reviving it. You know, I started it in 2014 and I naively said it would be done by 2016. Uh, but then I started adding more interviews. I think I have like 20, 22 interviews or so. So not only artists, you know, I have people like Bill, of course, Timothy Greenfield Sanders, Chuck Close, uh, Joyce Tennyson, uh, I'm trying to think. We don't have all the women that I want to have there. I want to get to Sandy Fellman. And the I, big loss was Mary Ellen Mark passed away before I got a chance to interview her. But I did get a couple of interviews with Elsa Dorfman and Neil Slavin, but also people at Polaroid who actually were instrumental in, in this thing coming to life and staying alive. It was never an easy thing, just as it's not an easy thing now. You know, you, you think of it in, you know, the Polaroid did this great thing, but, you know, just like anything in a large organization, there's politics involved and there's, you know, factions who want to who want to kill it and it costs too much, it doesn't make any money, the publicity is bad, we don't get it. And so it was always a fight to keep it alive. And so part of that film, you know, certainly draws on those people. Uh, and then a couple of critics, I have Marvin Heiferman and, and A.D. Coleman uh, as well. So. Uh, but you can always do more. So, uh, but I, I need an ending for it. So I'm not sure what that's going to be yet. Yeah, probably going to China. That that would be the perfect ending, right? You know, to have some, but it hasn't happened yet. So <laughs> keep, I keep refining. I keep redoing the interviews. I was actually working on Bill's interview, uh, which I did in 2014, uh, where I think I only had him for like 18 minutes, but it's like 18 perfect minutes. So very hard to edit down below that there. And uh, so. And he just said great things. I, I couldn't. I couldn't beat. Up. If I interviewed him again, I'll bet I couldn't do it as well. But 
uh, we might again. We're talking about maybe coming up to Maine this summer and doing an extended interview uh, about a broader thing, you know, the Polaroids and maybe maybe more. So hopefully that happens. Yeah, I hope so. We look forward to seeing it. People, of course, Phil, everyone wants to know who's behind you exactly and if you will show us. <laughs> right, well, I'll drag the camera around and, and you'll see um, that's Topper and you see him? <laughs> yeah. He is. He's very long. Hang on. There's the end of him. There's his <laughs> sister, Flo. Oh. He's a phenomenal performer. <laughs> She's like a, a lot like um, Pei was. And there's uh, Christine over there. Wave. <laughs> He's standing by. There's, there's outside. We'll just look outside. Sunny and bright. The world. <laughs> some of my postcards and these postcards are all over the place there's some more and they're in suitcases and this is a postcard painting that i just finished practically finished it's uh, all these divided motel cards so around and around and around another one that i like here I like the circular shapes you're working with now. That's kind of a departure yeah. from what I saw last. Yeah. So do you work out one painting at a time or are you moving on? I work out one at a time, but I've been painting a lot. So, uh, so they're everywhere. <laughs> they're everywhere. And this is Christine's library and she works on her books here. And she's really happy. She'd love to be interviewed no. by you. Okay. <laughs> So this place is really great. So here I am, ping pong. There's your ping pong table. Bill is really great at ping pong. He is. I don't think I've I ever been. Dog. Dog. People really want the dogs. This is where, this is Flo's uh, workout area. <laughs> so if you keep in shape, it's silly topper. <laughs> Posing there. Yeah. Like, Get this. Why aren't you getting this? <laughs> yeah. All right, that's a famous line from Barbara Bush, right? That's right. We we were trying to do the puppies, and you know she didn't know anything about the camera. Nobody pre prepped her or anything, and she didn't get that it took a long time to set it up or to shoot it. Why so she turned to Bill, "Why aren't you getting this? Look yeah, at them. They're wonderful. Why aren't you getting this?" And then she walked out the door and didn't see one of them. They were all waiting to peel on the floor. And then someone had to run after her and get her and bring her back to see the final pictures. And then she said, yeah, "You were genius." How did you get them so fast? <laughs> Right. She was really sweet. Uh, I liked her. Polaroid. But anyway, that's well, our that's life. Great. Thank you for that studio tour and showing us the dogs. I just wanted to add that um, Manuel was is saying a lot in the questions in the Q and A section about how the timing of when you guys came down to Miami it was at the height of the Marielle crisis, and that. Um, Nobody at the low would take you to Little Havana and he had right? to fly yeah. down. We talked about this right before we started that it was, you know, the, the change in Miami from then to now. But I had read also some of the uh, newspaper articles, which our collections department had thankfully saved and um, carefully archived that, you know, some people were not so happy about how Miami was portrayed or the locations. And that, you know, the difference now, of course, it was right after Christo had done the surrounded islands and they mm. wanted, you know, they were trying to build Miami to the, to the city that it is today in the art center. So, so we didn't help, huh? I guess we didn't help. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, it's interesting now. I wonder what if, if I know you've been back to Miami both many times since then and we had you come in 2010. I wonder what you would choose now <laughs> to shoot in Miami yeah, if you were to yeah. visit again. Well, <clears throat> I came back with Rauschenberg in 1987 and we went around to a number of sites in some pretty dangerous neighborhoods. Uh, and I don't remember who was advising him uh, on where to go, uh, but that was that was pretty cool too. So it was, it was right, there was a hurricane started it. I remember the first day we got there, we were in the hotel and the camera was on the loading dock. I was very worried it was going to blow away. I mean, literally. I mean, it was like the palm trees were going back and forth like this outside the window and everything. Uh, it was also right after the stock market crashed 500 points in 87, which uh, 
also was, was a memorable addition to that. Like, like is he, you know, is, is it going to be a, people thought it was going to be a depression, you know, and, and everything just because of that. Well, I guess I'm really no help if you want to uh, make your city look great. <laughs> I apologize for that. It was just a, there's well, always his, a his personal appearances there. When he, when he shows up in his shorts, that, that's, yeah. that's adding to the beauty of the city. <laughs> No, I think it was just a few, you know, people that wanted some idea. But I think it's important that people know that they that you had, you could shoot whatever you wanted. Um, but I think that was what was so great about it was that, you know, you could see it was obvious that you were feeding off the energy and the spontaneity of the crowd, which I think is what um, Manuel and Nestor were talking about. Um, exactly. But I wonder if you could speak to that a little more about, um, you talked about how it was instantaneous and how that helped you with your with your work. And it just seems like you're still continuing on that path with all the props and even the, po the suitcases that you just showed where you're keeping all your postcards, I imagine were once props or are you collecting those as well? Well, I guess, yeah, they, they, you know, who could resist buying a suitcase for like $2, come on. Uh, <laughs> So I have them and they, they get used, they, you know, I pack when I go to Maine, they, they pack well with all my art supplies or whatever I need. So, so that's that. Um, I have a whole house full of incredibly ugly dresses uh, that uh, the dogs used to wear and uh, outfits, just thousands of these things. And I was going to... I was going to get rid of them, but who said that I couldn't? Lola, right? <laughs> Lola. My daughter said I couldn't get rid of them, so their, their whole house is just filled with these things. Incredible. I completely agree with your daughter, by the way. <laughs> yeah. Not get rid of anything. I think it would be great to have, um, you know, the collection or a show with all the props and all the you know, it's really sort of shows your eye for things, you know, we talked about that curtain and all the patterns and the fabric, you know, that was, you know, that you were just, you know, whatever was catching your eye, but you, it was clearly part of your aesthetic. Yeah, when MoMA gives you your full-blown retrospective, like they did Tim Burton, you can have the, the, the fabric room and the, the dress room and then the Polaroid room and the paintings and we'll bring the camera down. Why not? We'll put it on display. You know, just every every artifact from your life physically on display. Who can we get to work on that? <laughs> <laughs> so are you planning to use the Polaroid again, Bill? I'm more into the digital uh, stuff right now. I think for me, that was a period and I Recently, a couple of years ago, I went back and, or was it last year, two years ago? Well, it was before COVID, yeah. yeah. I, would, I wanted to come back. I mean, we, we, you know, we just kept saying we should try it again, but it, it, it's a different time now. And I, I certainly don't, I get it, you know, that he's moved on and everything. Really like, uh, it was 79 to 2007, something like that. And yeah, it's a long time. Like it's a long time. Yeah. And it was a continuous body of work that really, holds together and uh when you take like a 20 year break and you try to jump back in yeah other things have happened uh, maybe if we're successful in making a new black and white film that might be a rationale to try it you know? i really love the film and i love the camera and working with you is phenomenal so if, you know we'll do it again somehow. yeah it's a lot more expensive than back in the day I, I was i almost fell over when i saw the quote what the rental was back then 600 a day and 25 a shot. So, so now it's not, I mean, if you think about inflation and everything, it, it's, it's like 1750 a day and then 150 a shot. So the film went up a lot, but to, you know, we barely make any money, believe it or not doing it there. It's very expensive thing to maintain. And, and uh, w once I spun a company out from Polaroid, I realized just how much of their overhead infrastructure had absorbed a lot of the uh, the production for it and everything. Because at any given time, we might have had as many as 20 different employees who sort of attended to producing the film and the, and the reagent and the pods and, and doing my shipping and, and my customs work, all that stuff I never had to do when Polaroid was there. So so it wasn't their full-time jobs, but they they would you know have completely address their specific expertise when needed 
And uh, once I've spun out, I have to do all of that, you know, from the doing the websites to the Facebook to to the bills and, and doing production. I make, you know, I help make the pods. I pack the pods. I pack the film. And uh, it's not quite uh, the way it used to be. And certainly something I didn't realize I'd get so caught up in doing in the latter years was, was really being pretty much the factory rather than the shooter. Uh, so I don't know if that's ever going to change. I think what I liked about it, especially with the dogs, is you could tell, and that's a tr trouble I had with first getting used to digital, was you could just Photoshop something. If you want a dog riding a bike, you know, just just, uh, just digitally put them there. But with a Polaroid, you could tell that they're really doing it. And there's something really powerful about that, uh, knowing that the, it's real and captured at that moment, which is what's so great about photography. And also that they're always that size. That's something I really like. They're always 20 by 24 vertical. Yeah, yeah. You put some together, but that took a lot of, um, saved me a lot of thought. And then when I switched to digital, I had to think, how big? Uh, should I get rid of this spot? Should I change this color? All of these things that are kind of a corruption in a way. Hmm. Yeah, it seems and, to take a lot of the spontaneity that is so obvious in the yeah. shoot, especially in instant Miami pictures. That was that lends to the energy of the whole. I think so. The whole series. There's a depth to the Polaroid images too. I think because it is a a contact print, you know, which is even different than the highest resolution digital print. You know, I think there's a a bit of a flatness in digital prints that that the, compared to the Polaroids were. You really kind of sense a physical depth, you know, and then also the you, you sense that there dies on top of a surface too. So there's a much more physicality to the to the image uh, with the, with the when you see them in person. You have to see them in person to to get that, obviously. Uh, yeah, but just I, I like that comment, Bill. That it was always twenty. It's it just that it's that singular format that you don't change. Uh, right. Oh, great. Well, I can't thank you both enough for your again for your time and for sharing, you know, your passion and your collaboration. And it was so great to just hear you guys reminisce about the images that you were showing and showing us the um, location images of the um, actual pictures being taken. It was really an honor and great fun. I had fun seeing them too. Thanks, John. Yeah, thanks, Bill. And thanks for inviting thank us. You, Jody. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, everybody, oh, you're the rest of your you guys at the museum. Thank you. Yes, thank you. And we hope that you will all join us for our next talk. And please come and see the exhibition in person if you can, or you know, come down to Miami and see us. And we hope everyone has a great rest of your night. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, bye -bye. everyone. Bye. Bye.